You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. N2K has teamed up with AWS to bring you AWS in Orbit, a groundbreaking new series that explores the impact of space technology, cloud computing, and generative AI. Hi, I'm Maria Varmazas, and in this series, I speak with industry leaders to give you a nuanced understanding of how these technologies are revolutionizing sectors like sustainability, critical infrastructure, and cybersecurity. So if you're drawn to big ideas and are curious how space and cloud technologies are impacting life here on Earth, this series is for you. Follow the T-Minus Space Daily podcast to catch every episode of AWS in Orbit and visit space.n2k.com slash AWS to stay ahead of the curve. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Iranian hacktivists claim an attack on a Pennsylvania water utility, North Korea's increased attention to supply chains, Rice Sita's action against British and Chinese targets, sandworm activity puts European power utilities on alert, Neanderthals and the telecopy bot, Mirai-based botnet activity. Our guest is Chris Betts, the new CISO of AWS Security, with insights on the upcoming AWS reInvent conference, And just how easy is it to track the comings and goings at Mar-a-Lago? Today is November 27th, 2023. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is your CyberWire Intel Briefing. Our top story today involves an Iranian hacktivist group, the Cyber Avengers, who have managed to infiltrate the control systems of a water booster station operated by the Municipal Water Authority of Aliquippa in Pennsylvania. The station, which serves Raccoon and Potter townships, triggered an immediate alarm during the breach, but the hack did not compromise the safety or supply of water to the localities. The attackers made their political stance clear by displaying an anti-Israel message on the station's monitors, targeting the Israeli-made Unitronics control system used by the utility. Operators quickly countered the attack by switching to manual controls. Previously, the Cyber Avengers have focused their attacks within Israel, targeting utilities like Mekarot's CCTV system, and falsely claiming to compromise the Dorad power station. Their move to attack a U.S. utility represents a significant escalation in their operations, broadening their geographic scope of targeting. 
This incident serves as a wake-up call to the industry, emphasizing the need for increased vigilance, robust cybersecurity measures, and the readiness to revert to manual operations should technological defenses be breached. It also highlights the geopolitical dimensions of cybersecurity, where domestic infrastructure can become a proxy battleground for international tensions. By the way, our rural Pennsylvania desk tells us that Aliquippa, PA, provided much inspiration for the 1980s Tom Cruise film, All the Right Moves. Microsoft has identified a supply chain attack by North Korean group Diamond Sleet, also known as Zinc. This operation involved tampering with a CyberLink application installer, embedding malicious code capable of executing a secondary payload. Notably, the attack utilized legitimate update infrastructure and a valid CyberLink certificate, making detection challenging. This incident has already affected over 100 devices across several countries, including Japan, Taiwan, Canada, and the U.S., Simultaneously, UK's NCSC and South Korea's NIS warn of North Korean hackers increasingly targeting software supply chains, exploiting zero-day vulnerabilities in third-party software. These attacks serve broader North Korean state goals, generating revenue, espionage, and stealing advanced technology. So, it may be worth checking to be sure your S-bombs are properly secured. The Raisida ransomware gang emerging in May has breached the British Library, compromising employee data, and is demanding 20 bitcoins for the stolen information. Additionally, they've targeted the Chinese state-owned China Energy Engineering Corporation, asking for 50 bitcoins for that data cache. While Raisida's attacks align with Russian cyber privateering patterns, their choice to attack a Chinese entity is unexpected, and suggests potential limits to their coordination or a shift in the Kremlin's stance on cyber aggression towards allies. A U.S. government advisory highlights Raisida's opportunistic targeting across vital sectors and their ransomware-as-a-service operations, emphasizing the need for cross-sector vigilance and robust cyber defense strategies to counter such multifaceted threats. The Polish Institute of International Affairs has sounded an alarm over the intensified rate of Russian cyber attacks against NATO, with tactics ranging from data theft to system paralysis and disinformation campaigns. This uptick in aggression underscores the urgent need for enhanced collaboration within the Atlantic Alliance to safeguard critical state functions. The GRU's Sandworm Group is notably active, inciting calls from European energy sector leaders for heightened security measures to protect the power grid against these threats, particularly those emanating from Russian-backed teams aiming to destabilize EU member states through sustained cyber attacks. A report from ESET reveals a stark glimpse into the world of cybercrime, highlighting the use of Telecopy, a telegram bot that facilitates phishing operations, which criminals have dubbed Neanderthals. The scammers mock their targets by referring to them as mammoths. Recruitment is active on criminal forums, where candidates undergo a screening process and, if accepted, gain full access to Telecopy's phishing template resources. Required to join two specific channels, one for communication and the other for transaction logs, these Neanderthals operate within a structured community underscoring the sophisticated social organization behind some cybercriminal activities. Perhaps someday, these Neanderthals will find themselves extinct. Akamai has detected a new botnet, Infected Slurs, leveraging the Mirai malware framework and exploiting two zero-day vulnerabilities to proliferate. One vulnerability resides in network video recorders from an undisclosed manufacturer, and the other affects a wireless LAN router designed for hotels and residences. Patches are anticipated in December. The router vulnerability, initially identified as a single model, may extend to a related variant, raising concerns about the broader implications for the manufacturer's full product line, given the commonality of the exploited feature.
coming up after the break. Our own Rick Howard speaks with Chris Betts, the new CISO of AWS Security, with insights on the upcoming AWS reInvent conference. Stay with us. There's nothing worse than relying on a legacy SIM that your security team has outgrown, especially when it impacts your ability to detect real incidents. Hunter's SOC platform offers built-in, always up-to-date detection rules and automatic correlation that allows SOC analysts to focus on higher-value tasks that impact your organization. It's time to move to a platform that reduces risk, complexity, and cost for the SOC. It's time to replace your SIM. Learn more by visiting hunters.security today. This episode is supported by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. Be honest, do you comment your code? You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small note in the code, a code comment, to help others learn what isn't clear in the code... Sometimes we leave comments for other people. Sometimes we leave comments for ourselves, a type of breadcrumbs. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from purchase to production, and the documentation doesn't always cover changing team dynamics. So the Code Comments podcast, which is hosted by Jamie Parker, he's a red hatter and an experienced engineer. In every episode, Jamie recounts the stories of experienced technologists from all across the industry who share what they've learned from implementing new technology. So if you're interested in real stories from real people going through real change, check out the Code Comments podcast. You can search for Code Comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to Code Comments for their support. AWS Security has a new CISO, and his name is Chris Betts. N2K's Rick Howard recently caught up with Chris Betts to discuss insights from the AWS reInvent conference that's occurring this week. Hey everybody, Rick here. As you may or may not know, the CyberWire is an Amazon Web Services media partner. And between 27 November and 1 December of this year, AWS is hosting their annual reInvent conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, and online. I got to sit down with Chris Betts, the newly minted AWS CISO, to talk about the focus of his talk at reInvent. Chris has just recently replaced CJ Moses, who has moved up in the organization to be the CISO and VP of Security Engineering at Amazon, and Chris and CJ both report to Steve Schmidt, the CSO at Amazon. I've known Chris, it feels like, forever, and I started out by congratulating him on his new job. So congratulations on the new job. How about that? Congratulations. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> I am really excited to be here. So this is, this is a this is an incredible role. It's just wow. It, it's been it, it's it's been quite a journey. So we have the AWS reInvent conference coming up in Las Vegas. It's 27 November through 1 December, and you're speaking at a session called "Move Fast and Stay Secure: Strategies for the Future of Security." What are you going to be talking about? Our CSO, Steve Schmidt, and I uh, actually get to be on stage together, which is going to be a lot of fun. That's fantastic. It's, it's absolutely awesome. Well, and, and it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's a fun thing because, you know, three months in, uh, being able to, uh, to tag team with Steve is, uh, is, is an amazing opportunity. Talks are going to be focusing on some of the most current ways that we think about our cybersecurity opportunities, some of the awesome innovation that's going on in the cybersecurity space, and, uh, and, and really tries to provide a, a direction for customers as, as we're all thinking about how we've applied some of these technologies and how we should think about applying and using some of these technologies going forward. So one of the big points in the presentation, I, I believe, is how Amazon thinks about zero trust. And so that's a huge marketing term right now. A lot of people in our community flip our noses up about it because, oh, it's just uh, vendors talking about a new buzzword. But it is not. It is a fantastic strategy. So how does Amazon think about zero trust? Well, Rick, I, I think what you bring up is so important. Um, it, it, it's easy to get lost trying to take something off the shelf 
and apply it to your company. I, I've seen any number of of my my fellow CISOs. I've even tried it myself sometimes, and that's that, that's painful. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and, and you're right. The zero trust approach, the philosophy that that deeply involves things that you know about the environment, things you know about the user, things you know about the user's environment, and the actions that they're taking provides a really outstanding way to tailor their cybersecurity actions to, to, to what they're trying to do. And so my, my lesson that I, having seen a number of my peers and, and been, been on the journey myself uh, for zero trust in a number of places, the lesson that I've learned is that having a tailored, having a fit solution for you is so important. And it's all about the foundational elements, those building blocks. Um, and so I'm not going to steal thunder from my own talk, but recognize kind of where you can find those building blocks. Where do you have the building blocks that have spent a lot of time? And how do you use that to make sure that you're getting not the one size fits all solution, but really the tailored solution uh, for, for, for you, for your enterprise, for your business is so important. Well, I agree with that. I call that meat and potatoes, zero trust, because a lot of our peers feel like they have to reinvent the wheel to deploy a zero trust philosophy. And in reality, you're already using things that have zero trust capabilities, especially AWS, right? They've got all kinds of things you could do to improve your zero trust journey. And that's true for a lot of different security tools, right? So it's not a rip and replace operation. It's just, it's an improvement exercise. Am I over-exaggerating that? I don't think you are. I mean, I think there, there, there's a, to be clear, there's, there's some discrete discrete new approaches and, and mindset and philosophy that you need to use. But you're right. I mean, so much of cybersecurity is built on a really, really strong technical foundation. Knowing that you have those right capabilities, you know, as you said, at AWS, we build a bunch of really great, strong technology foundation that gives you the right place to, to much more easily get the solution that fits you. At least that, that's how I approach the problem. I, I like the way you talk about it is that, you know, it's, it's not about the buzzwords. It's not about the, uh, the, the flashy bells. Getting this to work right starts off with a really solid foundation that's designed to work at that scale and, uh, and, and in the way you need to for Zero Trust. So the conference is AWS reInvent. It's going on in my favorite city of all time, Las Vegas, uh, 27 November to 1 December. Chris, any last words you want to uh, encourage people to come out? Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I, I hope everybody will attend or tune in. Uh, there, there's a lot of content available online for AWS reInvent, as you said, starting uh, starting on Monday. And I'm also excited to share that the dates and location for AWS reInforce, which is our security-focused conference, have been announced. It's uh, June 10th through 12th in Philadelphia. And this is the best security learning conference that, that, that I've been at in a long time. Um, and, uh, and so finally, thank you, Rick uh, and NTK for talking to me. It's been great to, to see you again. And I hope to see you uh, at, uh, at, at reInvent and at Reinforce next summer. That's the new CISO at AWS Security, Chris Betts, speaking with my CyberWire colleague, Rick Howard. And now, a word from our sponsor. The Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute is currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Want to see for yourself? Student researchers will be presenting their capstone projects on December 13th and 15th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on JHU's Homewood campus. For more information about their projects and the MSSI program, visit isi.jhu.edu. Wrapping up today's show, in the digital age, espionage has evolved dramatically from the daring feats of individuals like Mary Bowser during the American Civil War to a more subtle yet pervasive form of data gathering. Using legal and openly available data broker services, reporters at Rolling Stone have demonstrated the ease with which one can access detailed information about individuals, including their movements and personal characteristics. 
They set their sights on profiling visitors to former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence, revealing not only the demographics of Trump's visitors, but also their likely homes and workplaces. This ease of data acquisition underscores a significant shift. Now, anyone can conduct surveillance from the comfort of their home, posing risks not just to public figures, but to everyone. Our daily digital footprints, often unknowingly left through innocuous apps, become fodder for data brokers, creating vulnerabilities that can be exploited for all sorts of purposes, including surveillance and manipulation. It might just be time to write that letter to your representative in Congress about federal data privacy legislation. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast where I contribute to a regular segment on Jason and Brian's show. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.